All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I believe people are coming in now. Uh, up here, hi, my name is Nate. Uh, and then we also have Glenn uh, on board. Um, we are letting everybody come in. Uh, I'm sorry, we were a little bit late, but Glenn and I were just going over last minute details uh, about it, uh, about what we're gonna do today. So we have, it is after 11. I like to start things a little bit early, so I apologize for that, but we are gonna get going right away uh, so that we can see the pretty flowers uh, and uh, sorry, well, if I'm, if I'm distracted, it's because I'm admitting people into the meeting uh, at the same time that I'm trying to get this going. So uh, I just want to make sure that uh, everybody can hear me. Well, first of all, everybody know where the chat feature is on your, uh, on Zoom. There is a chat feature. You may have to, uh, if you don't see it, there's um, three dots on your menu bar that uh, it says chat or more and then there's a the chat feature. That is how you are going to use, uh, how you are going to ask uh, your questions or if you have any comments, uh, you can put them in there and I will be monitoring that uh, to make sure that it's uh, okay. Yeah, there are echoes. Okay, let me try something different. I'll take out my earbuds. Hopefully that's better. Is that better, everybody? Maybe not. Uh, I think so. I can't see Glenn. See here. Okay. So. Uh, that's not good. No. All right. There, well. No? Hopefully it's just my end that has the uh, the echo, and Glenn will will be better. Um, but I want to get this going so that we're not too late in the day because it is a nice day and I want you to get outside before it gets too hot. Um, so as I said, my name is Nate. I am with Tuliomi. Uh, and my job with Tuliomi is to usually get you guys outside and enjoying uh, the wonder of the Northern Inner Coast Range. Uh, but since we can't get outside as a big group, uh, I am now doing these things. Um, hopefully, it brings you some joy while you're inside uh, today. Like I said, uh, if you have a question um, or a comment, use your chat feature, and I will be monitoring that throughout the throughout the. Uh, the program today. Sorry, going back into things. I'm getting comments that it's not better. <laughs> no, it's not. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh oh. Okay. Is this better? What are you looking for, Nate? I'm looking to see if it is better. People are saying that it's worse. They can't understand. Nothing like that. Uh, You're coming through loud and clear here. Okay. Yes. He's so frozen. again, as you as uh, it said in the introductory email, you need to be sure that your camera is off, and we want to make sure that uh, the camera is off and that you are muted. That will help everything a lot. Because of so many, yeah. Uh... All right, so I'm just scrolling through here. It looks like most people have their videos off and are muted. That's fantastic. Okay. So we're getting, yes, everything is fine. Everything is not working. So we have a mixture of yes, it's working and a mixture of no, it's not working at all. <laughs> so um what is working and what is not working 
Uh, people are saying nothing's working. People are saying everything's working. Some people are saying it's uh, echoey. Some people are saying no echo. So, oops, giving you a little preview there. <laughs> so, okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with it because uh, I don't want to spend all of our time to this morning work uh, just trying to solve our our technical issues. Um, if it is, uh, if you are unable to stay with us through this thing, we are recording it. So we will have it up uh, and available uh, in the future and we will send that out to everybody. Um, okay, so here we go. As I was saying, Nate Lilge, I work for Tuliomi, getting everybody outside and enjoying the wonderful place uh, our deep home place, which is the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument region, the Northern Intercoast Range Mountains. This is uh, one of our ways to get you guys to enjoy outside, inside. Uh, it's bringing deep home, our deep home place into your home at this time. Uh, we have produced lots of videos, short videos uh, that we have put up on YouTube. Uh, for you to enjoy outside, inside, you can go to YouTube and just search for Tuliomi and you will see all of our videos there. Um, let me see. Uh, one of the videos that we put up, uh, if you haven't seen it already, uh, is a walk through the Lupin at Silver Spur Ranch, which is where this tour is going to be today. So if you haven't seen that, then absolutely go on there, uh, go onto YouTube and search Tuliomi and watch that walk through the loop in. Um, this is our second of three planned wildflower tours. So the first one was at the Woodland Regional Park and that was in early April. Uh, and that was dealing with a, or we toured a vernal pool and saw the flowers that were there. Uh, this tour is at Silver Spur Ranch, uh, which burned in 2018. And then the next one, uh, oh, so we'll see the flowers that are kind of associated with a burned landscape transitioning back into what it, a normal landscape. And then the last one, uh, which will be coming up in a couple of weeks, we haven't nailed down the date yet. Uh, that's gonna be uh, a tour similar to this in Bear Valley, uh, which is one of the great places to see wildflowers in this area. So, let me see. I think that is the big introduction for this slide. I'm going to go on to talking uh, a little about a little bit about Silver Spur Ranch, well, Tuliomi and Silver Spur Ranch. Tuliomi, uh, we work in the Northern Intercoast Range Mountains, which is basically from the San Francisco Bay Delta to the Klamath Mountains coming down from the south, and then Sacramento Valley to uh, Highway 101. East to West. Nestled in there is the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument, uh, which is over 330,000 acres. Uh, it stretches from uh, by Stebbins Cold Canyon by Lake Berryessa all the way through the Snow Mountain Wilderness. Uh, Tuliomi focuses on protecting public lands in that area. Uh, we work uh, with many different partners, including the Bureau of Land Management, the Forest Service, Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, we do lots of mercury, or we do mercury mine uh, restoration, uh, habitat restoration, um, public outings like this. We work with school, uh, with school groups, get them, get the kids out on the trail and do lots of fun things. So Silver Spur Ranch right here, you can see, this is uh, Ben Moore Canyon in the picture. It is uh, the main canyon or the main valley that runs through uh, Silver Spur Ranch in Lake County. Um, the, this landscape was burned in 2018 uh, and those cabins that you see are no longer standing. Now it is uh, just a bunch of uh, metal <laughs> from the support and the uh, mattress springs that were in there, but it burned in 2018. So this picture was taken in 2016 when it looked uh, much different. Um, most of the pictures that you will see today of the wildflowers were taken in Ben Moore Canyon. 
Um, Silver Spur Ranch is very important in the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument because uh, it's located at the narrowest spot east to west. So uh, Tuliami was able to purchase this uh, in 2016 uh, through the generosity of donors. Um, and we saw it as an important piece to allow for, um, oh shoot, what am I, uh, corridors, wildlife corridors for plants and animals uh, to get through in the monument, securing that, um, making sure that the wildlife has uh, a home to live in. So currently along with, or the reason we go up to Silver Spur quite often is because we are doing a, uh, a study to see how the fire has impacted uh, animals on the property uh, and plants. We are studying to see how they have returned. Um, we have about 10 game cameras on the property that we service monthly, every two months to go out there and get that. Um, there's more information about that on our website and I'm happy to talk to you about it uh, offline after this uh, somehow, um, if you are interested in that. Okay, going on to Dr. Glenn Holstein. He is our leader for today. I'm just here doing all the admin stuff. He's gonna be our expert quote, in the field. Uh, so Glenn Holstein uh, received his PhD in botany on the influence of climate on vegetation, vegetative form and function. He got that from the University of uh, California at Davis. Maybe you've heard of it. Uh, he was the senior scientist at Zentner and Zentner. He is a member of Tuliomi's board. Uh, let's see. Scrib trying to read my scribbled notes here. The Environmental Council of Sacramento uh, awarded him with the Environmentalist of the Year in 2013. And the Sierra Club Mother Low Chapter awarded him with the Conservationist of the Year in 2018. I think I got that right. <laughs> uh, so I am going to turn it over to Glenn. Glenn is going to be uh, our expert talking about each of the flowers and I will be advancing the uh, slideshow. Again, use the chat feature if you have any questions about a flower uh, or if you have any concerns about anything. Uh, I am here to help you guys today. And Glenn, here we go. Well, good morning, folks. Um, I really uh, enjoy volunteering as a board member and doing these virtual tours for uh, Tuliomi because it's a wonderful organization. Uh, Nate touched on some of the things that we do at Tuliomi, but uh, this Silver Spur Ranch is, is a wonderful place. I had a chance to see it when it was first uh, uh, open to us as a possibility for uh, protection and we followed up on it and protected it because it was one of these holes in the National Monument, these private inholdings that could be developed uh, eventually and lose their habitat value. We didn't want that to happen. <laughs> so we moved in uh, proactively and uh, purchased it as a, a conservation area. And it's a very important conservation area because it's right in the headwaters of uh, Cache Creek. And it's within the Cache Creek watershed that uh, so much of our conservation activity has taken place from uh, actually developing the National Monument to Cache Creek, uh, getting Cache Creek's uh, wild and scenic river status to further downstream uh, Woodland Regional Park where we had our first tour. It's all part of this greater uh, North Coast Range ecosystem that's so important that we've been really the, the leaders in protecting it. It was kind of a forgotten part of California and it's always been called out as a a biodiversity hotspot. We're going to focus on the flowers today, but uh, we uh, we know also that it's a hotspot for many other uh, species as well. California is number one in uh, biodiversity for many different groups and overall on all groups uh, of all the 50 states, even though it's not the largest states, pretty large, but not the largest. It also is the largest in population. So uh, to keep these areas free uh, and in uh, as intact habitats with such a large population is a really big job and that's the job in our area that Tuliomi's taken on. So 
I hope you'll all uh, appreciate what Tuliomi is doing and, and help us continue this important work. So let's go on to the first uh, uh, picture now, Nate. This is uh, Baby Blue Eyes. This one is a real uh, typical California wildflower. It's found up and down California in the uh, Mediterranean climate zone. It's very widespread, but a very beautiful uh, little wildflower, uh, very much a spring wildflower. And this is uh, bird's eye gilia. Uh, this is another one that's quite widespread. In fact, uh, uh, there are uh, prairies that uh, this is the dominant flower so that uh, it colors an entire landscape in some places in a, in a good year. And this has actually been a, quite a good year for it. Uh, literally thousands of this uh, beautiful native wildflower can be seen in open areas uh, all the way from Southern California up into Northern California. Glenn, maybe you could touch on uh, about how big each of these flowers are, because there's no scale in a lot of these pictures. Yeah, they're about they're about the size. There's actually some quite some variation. Some of them are smaller than others, but this is probably oh about the size of a uh, a five cent piece. Um, you know, we uh, we do everything in metric, so we probably say it's. Uh, Oh, maybe about 12 millimeters in, in uh, across the across the flower. Yeah, oh, it's definitely here. There you go. There's a that's what a field of uh, bird's eye gilia looks like. Unfortunately, in a good year like this one, there are lots of fields like that. And this is what uh, we call uh, an example of a, a plant that's very much adapted to the California prairie. And uh, for a long time. Uh, and still to a great extent, these open areas were called grasslands, but as you can see here, and as John Muir saw when he uh, visited California back in uh, uh, 1868 and crossed the Central Valley, he found uh, the whole landscape like this covered with wildflowers. And he says the wildflowers were abundant and uh, the grasses not so much. Everywhere else he'd been in North America, he had a few flowers and lots of grasses here in California, mostly flowers and just a few grasses. So uh, we have a lot of grasses now, but most of those are not native. It's the wildflowers that are natives. Uh, and this is a good example, one that's a characteristic plant all the way from Southern California up uh, to uh, the very Northern part of the state, but mostly in, in uh, prairie habitats, gets into oak wood a little, little bit as well, but mostly prairie habitats, open areas that aren't dominated by trees or shrubs. If they're dominated by oak trees, we call that an oak woodland. If they're dominated by chaparral, we call that uh, dominated by shrubs, we call that chaparral. But if it's an open area, we call that California prairie. Very, very important part of our natural system. And because it was mischaracterized as non-native annual grassland for a long time, it's been a real conservation challenge to, to get these uh, wonderful areas of, of needed wildflowers protected because, you know, if it's just written off as uh, non-native annual grasses, boy, you can put a, a shopping mall and a, a whole new property development on these and, and the habitat is gone. That's actually what was planned at Woodland Regional Park. And it might have uh, eventually been planned at Silver Spur Ranch if Tule Umi hadn't stepped in and protected the, these little bits of California where we can see the state the way it was uh, over 100 years ago and, and actually going back for millions of years. Uh, Glenn, Billy asked how, when and how long do these uh, bloom, the bird's eye gilia? They, uh, they bloom, they peak around, uh, around April, and, uh, but that doesn't mean it's the end of the flowers because one of the things that uh, John Muir found when he walked across the Central Valley in the spring on the way to Yosemite Valley was that the valley was covered with uh, wildflowers in the spring. But when he walked back, when it started getting cold up in the Sierras and he walked back uh, down to the lowlands, he found uh, wildflowers, but they were completely different in September and October than the ones he'd seen back in April. And uh, we're very uh, unusual in the sense that we have uh, at least two, sometimes three crops of uh, wildflowers, different species that show up in a cycle throughout the year. This is one of the ones that's uh, very important in the spring around April, but we'll see others, uh, of course, 
these fires were taken, these pictures were taken in the spring. So uh, they're going to represent the uh, spring wildflowers, but maybe in the fall we'll take a different tour and, and see what comes up in September and October. All right. This is uh, blow wise. And it's another one that's a very widespread uh, native California wildflower. Um, it has a uh, life cycle a little bit like a dandelion. It's in the same family as dandelions. Uh, and if we can see the next uh, picture, this is how the seeds are spread. The flowers aren't very showy. The seeds then uh, are in these uh, parachutes that uh, the wind carries and, and uh, transports to, to new habitats like a dandelion, but it's in a very different part of the uh, composite family, which is the largest uh, family of plants here in California. It's in a very different part of that family from dandelions. This is actually uh, more closely related to some of you may be familiar with the silver swords that grow on the top of uh, Haleakala volcano on Maui and the Hawaiian Islands. They look like yuccas, but they're actually in the composite family. This is actually closer to the Hawaiian silver swords than it is to dandelions, even though the life cycle being an annual plant with uh, uh, seeds that blow away on uh, in the wind is uh, very similar. So ecologically, it's like dandelion. Taxonomically, um, genealogically, it's like the silver swords of Hawaii. This is another one that's very widespread in, in California prairie and gets into oak woodlands and even chaparral. Some this is blue dicks, and uh, very important uh, wildflower throughout most of California and the Mediterranean areas outside the mountains. Uh, it's this is this one's a bulb, and uh, for a long time it was uh, put in the lily family, but now it's uh, in uh, its own uh, section of the amaryllis family, which has been separated from the lily family. Uh, along with quite a few other of our kind of lily-like plants that are, are part of the uh, California landscape. And we can even get some that are white. Most of them are uh, blue-violet or uh, red-violet, but uh, once in a while we'll get one like this. It's a white uh, species. But there are also white relatives where the majority are, are white. This is another one that uh, in uh, areas like Jepson Prairie, right on the floor of the Central Valley, you can see uh, millions of these uh, buttery eggs, very common. Uh, it was probably one of the dominants on the floor of the Central Valley that uh, John Muir described in his walk across to Yosemite in 1868. But even today in certain places, you can see it covering the floor of the Central Valley and other prairie areas uh, in valleys in the coast range. And, in Silver Spur Ranch, there's kind of a, a small valley along Benmar Creek that uh, a plant like this can get established in and form these beautiful golden meadows. And these are really small. Yes, yeah. yeah, so very small, very delicate. Uh, this used to be in a family called the uh, Scrofulariaceae, for those of you that had botany courses a while back, but now it's separated out into a new family, Orobankaceae, uh, which we'll see some uh, more examples of later. And the Orobankaceae uh, is a family that uh, oftentimes has root connections with other plants. It's not a, there are some that are total parasites in the family, but most of them are hemiparasites where they get a little bit of uh, nutrient from other plants, but uh, they're much more independent. They do a lot of photosynthesis on their own. Glenn, Kelly is asking, how do the flowers get their common name? Uh, because uh, butter, they're yellow, and they have some other colors. Uh, eggs, there's some white in there too. So put the uh, yellow yolk and the, and the egg white together, and you get butter and eggs. And there's, I, there's yellow as well. I think so, she's I, talking uh, in general, how do all of the flowers get their common name? Like why, why are uh, the yeah. birds I... Uh, called that or baby blue eyes why is it called that you know that type of stuff well you know uh, there's a story that uh, the great California botanist Ledger Stebbins used to say uh, said that uh, there were uh, two groups that named the California wildflowers there were the uh, uh, school marms who 
uh, named them often after classical names from uh, uh, stories in Latin and Greek, uh, like Ethereal Spear, for example. And then there were the, the old farmers, and they would name things just as something that caught their eye, and uh, like this reminded them of breakfast. And uh, Blue Dicks reminded them of something else. So they, they came out with uh, all these little names that weren't so classical, but uh, they, a lot of them have stuck, and we've, we've kept them for our flowers uh, ever since they were first named back in the 1800s. And this is Indian pink. Uh, this is in the uh, pink family, but it's uh, very unusual because the pink family is tends to be uh, have a lot of little delicate plants. There's one called Irish moss, as you can so, so tiny you can barely see it. Um, this is a uh, family that uh, extends uh, almost further north and further south than any other plant family. There's actually one of the few families that actually gets to the edge of Antarctica and it gets up to the uh, highest part of the Arctic, but once in a while you get a few species like this one that are are not white and tiny and delicate at all, but they're very showy and they, they appeal to our hummingbirds. This is Indian pink in, uh, in the pink family, uh, one of the unusual members of the family that has these bright red flowers. And here they are close up, beautiful plant. Another uh, plant that is uh, quite uh, widespread in California, it tends to like a little uh, shade, so it's, you're more likely to see it uh, under the shade of uh, oak woodlands, oak trees in oak woodlands, and this is uh, Chinese houses. And uh, I guess people remembered uh, pagodas and uh, they it kind of reminded of, of pagodas with the, the shape of the uh, flowers. This is the other, one of the other major branches when the Scrophulariaceae was broken up, but this is the one that is actually merged into the same family as the uh, plantains that are really uh, ecologically more like grasses. But uh, if you look at the uh, genetics, there's a pretty clear link now with the plantains, and they call this family now the Plantagenaceae. And a lot of the uh, plants that were formerly in the Scroff family are now in this uh, Plantagenaceae, like Chinese houses here. Kalinzia heterophylla. And these are a little bit bigger. This, uh, these are probably, oh, uh, maybe a, few, a cluster like that is maybe a little inch and a half uh, wide. Got lots of them. Okay. Well, this is a common fiddle neck, Amsinchia intermedia. Uh, it looks like it's uh, next to uh, some burned wood there. It's a very, very tough uh, wildflower. It's one of the few that actually is tough enough that it can come back after cultivation. You can see uh, all over the Central Valley areas, if you don't uh, farm a particular area, uh, these uh, fiddle necks will come back and, and do just fine in among the weeds. And it's actually become a weed in other other continents. It's, uh, it's a weed in Australia, for example, and uh, very abundant there. But uh, this is where it's native, right here in California. It's a very, one of our most successful and uh, uh, a good survivor of a lot of disturbance, which we've had a lot of in California. And here it is again, common fiddle name. You can see the, the curve of the flower is, uh, looks like the end of the fiddle. Yeah. This is in the uh, borage family. Well, one of the most uh, beautiful plants of the uh, North Coast Range, and only in the North Coast Range, is the Golden Fairy Lantern. Uh, it's uh, got a very narrow range only in California and pretty much only in the Coast Range uh, pretty much coincidentally with the uh, uh, boundaries of the uh, Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument. So it's a really iconic uh, plant for our new national monument and uh, a real beauty. And it's called a fairy lantern because uh, it uh, hangs down, whereas most of its relatives have upright bowl-shaped flowers. This one uh, hangs down like the classic uh, uh, Chinese lanterns that people are familiar with. Here it is again. There's another one called a fairy lantern that is uh, 
uh, widespread further south in California, and that has a, a whitish pink flower, but a very similar shape. Well, here's Indian Warrior, and uh, this is another one in that uh, Orobankesi uh, family, the one that had butter and eggs in it. Uh, one of the characteristics of that family is that uh, you have a lot of uh, flowers very uh, closely clustered together. But this one is in a different habitat. This one tends to be more in chaparral in among the shrubs uh, and in uh, areas where uh, you're not so much uh, in a prairie habitat or an oak woodland habitat. Oak woodland being associated with the uh, Chinese houses and prairie habitat associated with uh, butter and eggs and uh, the uh, birds like Ilium. Uh, so we have a couple of comments uh, or questions rather. Uh, James is asking, yes, uh, whether we will be able to view this later. Yes, uh, for those of you that didn't hear right when I started, um, we will we are recording this and so we will have it available to you and anybody that may have missed this. Uh, and Julie is asking, Glenn, uh, is this related to uh, or another name for Indian paintbrush? And I can answer that one. That's It is no. not another name for Indian paintbrush, but it is related. Uh, they're, in the, they're in the same family, the sort of bank case here. So you have butter and eggs in it, you have Indian warrior in it, different genus. And then you have uh, Indian paintbrush, which uh, now also includes some of what we used to call, out, well, we still call them owl's clover, but uh, uh, the owl's clover group has been broken up and some of them are included with uh, the, uh, the paintbrushes. And we will see uh, paintbrushes later on in the slideshow. Yep. Um, and then Robin Carlson uh, asked, oh, I hope this is a big word, a couple of different big words, I hope I can pronounce them correctly. Uh, do oral branches have specific plant hosts for their root associations or are they more cosmopolitan? I got the last one right. Good question. And uh, I suspect they're cosmopolitan, but I don't have the information on that, uh, on what they're associated with. They, but they tend to be in uh, a pretty wide uh, spread uh, uh, they're fairly widespread. They have lots of uh, uh, different associated plants with them in chaparral throughout California. So I, uh, I doubt if they're associated with one particular host because they are pretty widespread, but I don't have any specific information. On that. But it's good you caught out that they're, they're in that uh, family of hemiparasites, so they probably do have a host. Well, here's two uh, larkspurs. And they're in the uh, uh, Delphinium genus in the uh, buttercup family. And we have two uh, here, one's blue, it's quite widespread in uh, uh, both, uh, mostly in oak woodland habitat and uh, the same for the, uh, uh, the red uh, Delphinium, the red larkspur. And uh, as you can see, they're uh, very different colors and even different shapes. And uh, red flowers tend to be associated with pollination by hummingbirds. Hummingbirds like the color red, they zero in on the color red. And because they have long uh, bills, and at least in our hummingbirds, very straight bills, you can see that uh, the, uh, uh, the red larkspur has uh, more of a tubular flower to accommodate a hummingbird bill, whereas the uh, blue larkspur Delphinium patens has a more open flower to accommodate uh, bees and other insects that do the pollination there that uh, are attracted to a blue and some of the other colors. So red tends to mean hummingbirds. Other colors like blue and yellow tend to mean uh, bees and other pollinating insects. Uh, are they about the same size? Pretty close to the same size, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And they're, they're fairly tall. They have a, a they, in both cases, the, uh, the flowers are, are well off the ground. And as you can see in the case of the uh, red larkspur, uh, they're uh, not very leafy. The, the flowers are pretty much off by themselves, well, well above the leaves. And here we have one of our native irises. Irises are a group that's very widespread across the Northern Hemisphere. 
And we have a number of native species like this iris uh, microsiphon in our North Coast range. Very beautiful uh, uh, native iris and unfortunately fairly common. Mostly oak woodland. And one of the plants that you see everywhere uh, all the way from Woodland Regional Park and uh, on the Central Valley floor up to prairie areas throughout uh, uh, the hills of California all the way from uh, the north down to Southern California are these miniature lupins, lupinus bicolor. And uh, lupins are, uh, are a challenge. You need a lot of uh, uh, microscopic or at least hand lens uh, uh, detail to be absolutely sure of the species, but uh, the common uh, miniature lupin that we have is lupinus bicolor. But there's some other other ones that are quite similar that uh, uh, you want to make sure that uh, you're not uh, mixing up with the uh, miniature lupin. These are really small, as the name Very would small. suggest. Although sometimes uh, the same species can be uh, considerably larger than your finger there. This is a small example, but it can be uh, uh, quite a bit larger than that. Not, it's not a big lupin, but it's not always that small either. And here's a, another one, very blue. But then when you get out in the open prairie and you get uh, these big masses of much more showy lupins, but fairly closely related to the miniature lupins, this is a sky lupin, lupinus nanus, and this is the one that uh, sometimes can color uh, many, many acres of, uh, of Bear Valley, for example, in this uh, beautiful blue and white, like we can see that this year. Uh, April's a good time to do up in Bear, Bear Valley and see huge masses of sky lupin. And one of the uh, very common lupins is uh, the yellow lupin, uh, Lupinus microcarpus densiflorus, and uh, as you go up uh, through the canyon of uh, first Cache Creek and then uh, uh, Sulphur Creek on the way up to Bear Valley on the hillsides, little, little uh, prairie openings uh, among the oaks, this is really the commonest lupin, even though the vast majority of around 70 species of lupins we have here in California are some shade of blue, this, uh, this kind of uh, is a, a real exception because these are either yellow or white. There's some more of them. And as they age, they turn red too. It's more of the yellow lupin. And one of our uh, really characteristic uh, plants in the shade of oak trees is miner's lettuce. And uh, the common name is Claytonia perfoliata and Perfoliate means it has leaves that completely go around the stem and they're connected uh, to each other to form uh, a complete ring uh, below the flowers. And uh, this is another one that has been the taxonomist had a hard time with because it's quite a bit of variation. There's some close relatives that it's a question whether you want to split them out and call them a separate species or uh, include them in a larger miner's lettuce. Uh, the, trend, uh, the trend now is to have a larger group of uh, true miners lettuce now and uh, sometimes divide it up into different varieties, but very widespread in California, mostly in partial shade. And this is an edible plant, correct? And it is an edible plant. It was one of the, we call it miners lettuce because when the miners uh, back in uh, 1849 were looking for uh, some, a good place to get a salad and get some vitamin C, this was a, a nice edible plant that it was easy to find. It was all over in the uh, foothills in the Oak Woodlands, uh, foothills of the Sierra Nevada. And of course we have it in our own coast range here. But one of the really big showy plants uh, in the uh, kind of the edge of Oak Woodland um, and very widespread in just the coast range, there's other species if you get into the Sierra Nevada, is uh, a smooth mule's ears, uh, Waithia glabra. And as you can probably tell from the flower, it's closely related to sunflowers, but uh, this is a, a good native and a, a very large 
showy sunflower head. And a characteristic of that sunflower family is uh, it's actually called a composite because it's a composite of uh, little flowers in the center that are adapted for uh, producing pollen and accepting pollen for, for the seeds. And then uh, flowers along the edge that are oftentimes sterile and they're associated with uh, making a pretty picture for bees to come down and pollinate the, the group of flowers that are, that are in the center. So this is uh, a lot of these uh, composite associations are very tiny and hard to see, but there's no problem seeing the details and that it's a, a composite of many flowers with this mule ears because it's, it's so large and showy. Good one to see along the uh, road up to Bear Valley. It's usually at the edge of oak woodland. And here's another one in that uh, Orobankaceae family. This is uh, uh, the group of Alice clovers that are uh, associated with uh, uh, the paintbrushes, but uh, we still call it Alice clover for a common name. Um, it's uh, one of those uh, that have flowers clustered together, just like we saw with the butter and eggs and the Indian warrior. Uh, and we'll see later when we have a picture of a paintbrush. Uh, another one that has that tendency for a root connection with other species and here it is among uh, miniature lupins. But this is one that out in the, it's kind of a prairie plant and it can form uh, big masses of pink oftentimes in, uh, in a good year and uh, good conditions in California prairie. Very much uh, adapted to open spaces. And here's a woolly paintbrush, one of the two red paintbrushes that uh, you can find on the uh, way up to Silver Spur Ranch and the way up to Bear Valley. Um, you can uh, separate this from the other paintbrush that's up there, which has uh, bright green foliage. This one has a grayish foliage because it has a lot more uh, plant hairs along the uh, leaves and stems. So it gives it a, a gray, gray green look in the uh, red flowers tend to be a little bit paler red than the other species of uh, paintbrush that's common up there. Castilea foliolosa, and once again in that Orobankaceae family. Here it is close up, and you can see the, the, the hairs are tiny, but you can uh, see how they are thick enough that they can actually uh, change the color to make it a and not so bright green. It's, it's bright green under the under the uh, uh, covering of hairs, but uh, the whole plant is easy to recognize because of the uh, gray green color. Well, here's a common weed. We call it a weed because it's uh, not native to California, but it's uh, a very successful plant because it's a weed all over the world. It doesn't really uh, Unlike a lot of weeds, it doesn't crowd out the natives. It's a pretty delicate little plant, and it tends to grow in places where a lot of other plants won't grow, like in uh, on beaten paths and roads and things like that. It doesn't seem to mind it if it gets a lot of foot traffic. And we call it pineapple weed because if you reach down and uh, touch the foliage and bring a, a little sprig of it up, it'll smell just like fresh pineapple. Is it edible like pineapple? Oh, it won't uh, won't hurt you, but I don't think it's a it's a common one for salads either. It's got a pretty pretty strong taste. Okay, uh, is this related to mayweed? Yes, it is. And mayweed is another one that is uh, a non-native. Uh, they uh, come from Europe. They're native to Europe, and uh, of course, one thing about Europe that's had farming a lot longer than. Um, North America has, you know, it has farming that goes back, uh, now we know to uh, prehistoric times, uh, maybe as far back as 10,000 years ago in Europe. And so a lot of plants became very adapted to disturbance. And this is one of them, mayweed's another. A mayweed is one that uh, can actually uh, cause a rash for a lot of people if they, if they touch the uh, leaves or or have bare ankles and the bare ankles uh, brush up against mayweed. As far as I know, there's not the same allergy problem with pineapple weed. 
Uh, and just a comment from James, he said that uh, he's heard that you can make a tea out of pineapple weed and that it tastes like chamomile tea. Well, that makes a lot of sense because chamomile, of course, is uh, famous for tea and uh, it's a close relative of both mayweed and pineapple weed, so there's no reason why uh, uh, this wouldn't be a good tea plant very simple because it's closely related to chamomile. In fact, it actually for a while was even uh, lumped in the same genus as chamomile. Well, we get a lot of, uh, in the Borage family, uh, the one, same one that the uh, fiddle neck was in, we got uh, a very, very large number of species in uh, this uh, genus Plagiobothrys. The majority of them are associated with vernal pools and they tend to be uh, very low statured plants. But uh, some of them are uh, widespread prairie plants. And this is one of them, rusty popcorn flower. This will not be in vernal pools. It will be on patches of prairie in among uh, oak trees. And sometimes it'll, it'll be so abundant, it'll cover a whole hillside, almost white enough to look like it was uh, uh, covered with snow. Rusty popcorn flower. This is another one that has some very close lookalikes. So you want to, uh, if you're, you want to be precise about the species, you want to look at it very carefully. But uh, Plagiobothrys nothofulvus is the commonest uh, prairie popcorn flower in uh, uh, the uh, Bear Valley and uh, also the uh, Silver Spur Ranch area. And you can see it can be pretty tiny. Now, I'm not sure now, this actually is so tiny, it might be one of the uh, uh, vernal pool popcorn flowers and this is that's a group that unless you have a hand lens and, and uh, uh, a good uh, a good key or a good illustration they're very difficult to uh, tell apart in fact there's some controversy about uh, oftentimes uh, what species we're dealing with especially in vernal pools where a lot of the diversity is so just from the photograph that Nate sent me I can't be sure which one, which uh, popcorn flower this is maybe a rusty popcorn flower or maybe another one. I think it's a different one because I know where this picture was taken. Uh, since those are my fingers. Yeah, yeah, it's more of a vernal pool type area where these two were uh, more prairie-like. Yeah, so one. that, that uh, the ones in the vernal pools tend to have smaller flowers. They tend to be low and that makes a lot of sense. So the commonest one in uh, vernal pool habitats is one called Plagiobothrys stipitatus, and that this may well be that. That's a very widespread vernal pool uh, Plagiobothrys, but there are a number of others as well, that, uh, including some that are quite rare. All right, and then how do you distinguish uh, this from Cryptantha? Uh, great question. Cryptantha is a uh, related uh, genus in the same family, very, uh, uh, very diverse in California. Plagiobothrys has a lot of California species, over 50. Same way Cryptantha has even more. But uh, Cryptantha tends to be more associated with arid habitats. It tends to get more uh, abundant in, uh, more diverse, I should say, in as you get closer to the deserts in California. Uh, whereas uh, Plagiobothrys nothofulbus and all the other Plagiobothrys species are much more associated with the typical California environments, either vernal pools or prairies. But the easiest way to tell them apart, because we do have uh, some cryptantha in uh, both Silver Spur Ranch and Bear Valley, is the uh, cryptantha species have lots of very sharp hairs, almost like the hairs on a nettle. And you can actually see these uh, very easily if you, if you look closely. Whereas you notice here, uh, the uh, stems are quite smooth, very very few hairs at all. And on the uh, the uh, popcorn flower, the hairs tend to be more straight and not, uh, uh, in, the, in the case of the cryptantha, they tend to be uh, uh, kind of aligned with the stem and uh, much more obvious. In fact, uh, like the uh, woolly popcorn flower, they'll often tend to uh, make the foliage look kind of uh, pale green because the the covering of hairs on cryptantha is so uh, so total. 
Well, we have a, a little uh, poppy and poppies are, uh, you can uh, oftentimes identify because they have uh, four petals. Uh, this is a close relative of the uh, California poppy, but it's actually more abundant and it grows more on steep hillsides, whereas the California poppy grows uh, more on the floors of little valleys. Uh, but uh, sometimes you can see whole hillsides, prairie hillsides covered uh, with the golden yellow because of this uh, foothill poppy. Very, very common in uh, Silver Spur and uh, all through the North Coast Range. And here's the, the true California poppy. You'll notice that it has a little ring around the base and that's, uh, that separates it from the foothill poppy. And it's not a true leaf, but it's uh, <coughs> somewhat similar to the uh, perfoliate leaf on miner's lettuce at the, at the very base. And that's, that's only found in the true California poppy. Much larger flower than the foothill poppy. Well, here's purple, purple sanical. This is, uh, we've moved now into the carrot family. Uh, the majority of uh, uh, species in that family are, have uh, either white or yellow flowers, but this one is an exception. It has uh, purple flowers. And this particular uh, group tends to have some very poisonous uh, plants in it. So uh, anytime you're dealing with the carrot family, you wanna make sure that you got your identification right. Because if you eat the wrong one, it can make you very, very sick. Uh, one of the most famous uh, ones is uh, poison hemlock, which was supposedly the uh, plant that uh, was used to execute Socrates back in ancient Greece. Well, it's not native to California, but it's become one of the most abundant non-native plants in California. But this is a good native plant in that same family that has some poisonous relatives here in California as well. And here's one of our most uh, beautiful, very early spring plants, the Foothill Shooting Star. And uh, this is one, another one that likes the partial shade of oak trees. You'll find it in little shady groves where uh, oaks form almost a complete cover. Um, and uh, there are actually two groups uh, ecologically of uh, shooting stars in California. Uh, the ones that are like this one that are associated with uh, shady oak woodlands down in uh, fairly low elevations. And there's another group that are up in alpine meadows in the high Sierra, different species up there and several different uh, alpine meadow species. So uh, if you separate them by habitat, it narrows it down to, to fewer species to deal with. Uh, there's a, uh, one suite up in the Sierra Nevada meadows, another one down here in the uh, oak woodlands of low elevation California. Here's some more, and then to the right is vetch, which is one of the most abundant non-native uh, plants in Silver Spur Ranch. And the vetch has been brought in uh, by grazers because it's a very high protein, like a lot of legumes, uh, good for cattle feed, and it's really taken over a lot of the landscape in the North Coast ranges of California. So hopefully it's, uh, it's gonna leave some space for our natives like the shooting star, but it's a very, a very invasive, uh, deliberately planted legume. Richard is wondering if the shooting stars are now in the genus Primula. Um, they were in the, the same family as Primula, but at least in the Jepson Manual, they're still in Dodecathia. But that's a, that's a group that is uh, where the traditional Primula family has, has really been split up a lot, broken up into uh, three different families, things that used to be in the Primula family now are in three different families. And uh, so you may get different names in different sources. This is the name of the city in the Jepson Manual, which is our standard reference, but there have been some changes since the Jepson Manual came out in uh, 2013. And uh, here's another one of these uh, plants in the Orobankasi. Uh, this is valley tassels, and you can see it's closely related to uh, the alice clover we saw, same genus, also the genus that has the uh, paint brushes in it. But unlike those, it has uh, very inconspicuous flowers, and it tends to hide 
in among the uh, non-native grasses, very easy to overlook, but also very abundant throughout a lot of California. So it's a, it's a little native that kind of hides, hides among the uh, taller plants, but pretty easy to find. It's one that we think we found it at uh, Woodland Regional Park, right on the floor yeah. of the Central Valley. So it's, uh, it's hanging in there, even in areas that are surrounded by urbanization. Do these uh, prefer disturbed areas or do they care? Well, they could tolerate some disturb area, uh, disturbance, but they're not nearly as uh, tolerant of disturbance as the fiddlenecks, for example. So uh, they will uh, survive if they're given a chance, but they can easily be lost if there's too much disturbance. They're not very competitive. They're, they're pretty small plants. And here's a close-up of that vetch with a, a bumblebee right in the middle. Uh, uh, you can see that a lot of our pollinating insects have taken to these non-natives and uh, uh, so that uh, they provided habitat uh, for uh, plants sometimes that uh, for uh, insects that the, uh, the natives aren't providing even in urban areas. Uh, and our bumblebees are at risk. We're losing a lot of our bumblebees. We have uh, one uh, that uh, uh, was endemic to the uh, northwestern corner of California that hasn't been seen for quite a few years. Is concerned it may go, it may go extinct and bumblebees in general are in trouble, but it's good to see a nice healthy one on uh, vetch, even though the vetch isn't, uh, isn't a native wildflower. Uh, and this is a, a good reference point for everybody that we should have uh, brought in earlier in there. Uh, Ken was asking to give the elevation range for Silver Spur Ranch. Glenn, I know, but do you, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I think it, uh, up at the upper end, it's probably maybe gets up to close to a thousand feet and it gets down to maybe 500 below, but that's, that's just a guesstimate. Yeah, uh, we have... Nate, you think? Yeah, our silver, our uh, game cameras on the ranch uh, vary from just under a thousand to uh, over 1300. Okay. So, and, and probably down at the uh, lower end, it's, uh, it's probably uh, uh, even lower than that. Yeah. Yeah, so this, is, this would not be considered a high elevation kind of habitat. It's more typical California Mediterranean climate uh, vegetation. But uh, of course, there's even within that, there's a lot of regionalization. As you go further north, uh, you tend to get uh, even though it's very still very seasonable uh, rainfall, uh, there is there tends to be more rainfall in the north coast than there is, for example, in most parts of the south coast range. And I will say that uh, these pictures are all taken towards the bottom of hills. Uh, there are some taller hills that get uh, quite high that I have not wanted to climb yet, but maybe on a future trip out there I will be adventurous and, and do so but probably the park will open it up so it's a little easier to access some of these spots too yes that's true <laughs> all right well here's uh looks like it's doing quite well in the burn here's uh one of our very showy plants in the mustard family the mustard family is one that tends to have an awful lot of non-native some of them are pretty showy uh a lot of bright yellow mustard along the, uh, the roads in uh, Northern California. Uh, but this is a native mustard and a very showy native mustard and not, not the bright yellow uh, that are associated with the non-native mustards. This one has a, a uh, yellow orange flower, uh, quite similar in color to the, uh, to the foothill poppies. And this one tends to be in uh, kind of at the edges of oak woodland, even at the edges of chaparral, uh, not so much on open prairie as usually in close association with uh, trees and shrubs and usually on slopes. Do they like, are they one of the fire followers? Do they come in after fire? Not so fires? much, although it seems like uh, that it's not being hurt by the fire, but it's not a particularly uh, particular fire, a fire right. a follower like we have some species that are only found uh, maybe every 90 years or so when there's a burn of chaparral. That's the only time you, you really find them. So they become uh, quite scarce the rest of the year. Uh, 
but this one isn't uh, isn't like that. It uh, you see it every year whether there's a fire or not, but usually on just a few spots here and there, steep slopes, uh, close to uh, trees and shrubs. Now this is one of the most uh, beautiful and uh, really narrow in its range. It's very restricted to uh, the Central Coast Range and not even very common there. It's the jeweled onion, uh, Allium sera. And uh, I'm so glad that you were able to find a, a picture of this because uh, we've been up there many times and not seen this one. And uh, one of the most beautiful uh, members of uh, the uh, monocots, one that used to be in the lily family, but now uh, is has been split off into the uh, uh, Amaryllis family, and actually in its own family now. The, the tendency is to, even though it's in the Amaryllis family in the Jepson Manual, there's a tendency now to split off the onions as their own family, the Aliaceae. And we have, even though they're not as abundant as the uh, Brodias and their relatives, uh, they're actually uh, another one that is really uh, gone through a lot of evolutionary diversi diversification in California. We have lots of native onion species, just like we have lots of uh, native Brodea and their relatives here in California, many species in each group, but not, we're finding from genetics, we used to think they were fairly closely related, even though they look, Brodeas and onions look a lot alike, they're not very closely related at all. And I will say that uh, these two pictures were taken at different locations on the property. Uh, so they, the onion is not just in one specific place anymore or one specific place on the property. It's uh, multiple different places. So. Yeah, I'm so glad you could find this one because this is, this is not a common species. In a, it's also one of the most beautiful species up there. And here's a little yellow monkey flower. Um, this can be actually quite, uh, quite uh, large, sometimes maybe, oh, maybe two feet high, uh, very showy flowers, and uh, very widespread in California and Western US. But this is one that uh, it's almost uh, more abundant now in New Zealand where it's not native than it is in California. And uh, when I was in New Zealand, uh, New Zealand doesn't have a lot of showy wildflowers. Maybe because it's an island, it doesn't have a lot of uh, pollinators that uh, are attracted to, to showy flowers. So if you see a lot of showy flowers in New Zealand, uh, most likely they're non-natives that have been introduced there from somewhere else. And uh, one of the most abundant ones was this uh, yellow monkey flower. We'd see entire hillsides covered with it in New Zealand that really likes the New Zealand habitat. And uh, we had a great paleobotanist here, passed away uh, a decade or so ago, uh, named uh, Daniel Axelrod. And he talked about the uh, way California vegetation has changed in the last uh, several million years. He postulated that at one time, California was a lot uh, cooler and wetter. It had less of a, a Mediterranean climate. And it kind of makes sense because the major timber tree in New Zealand are Monterey pines. Well, Monterey pines here in California are just hanging on in a few pockets along the coast. But if you take them over to New Zealand, they get bigger and they grow more abundantly and more easily than they do anywhere in California. And uh, some of the uh, older ones actually almost are the size of Douglas firs uh, over in New Zealand, whereas they never get that big here in California. So would so, this be considered a, a weed down in New Zealand? Yeah, it would probably be considered a weed down in New Zealand, although it certainly adds a lot of color to the landscape. <laughs> so in other words, what, uh, what Axelrod and, and uh, the students would postulate is that uh, New Zealand has a climate a lot more like uh, California had maybe, uh, maybe 30 million years ago. Well, remember baby blue eyes. Here's a... Uh, a uh, miniature relative of it, uh, variable leaf nemophila, and this is another one that you want to make sure you carefully identify. This is the commonest species around here, but in other parts of California, there's some lookalikes, 
that are related but uh, look very similar. Sorry. And let's go back to that one. Yeah, sorry. And, uh, this used to be uh, in its own family along with baby blue eyes called the water leaf family, Hydrophilaceae, but uh, now that family has been found genetically to be lumped in with uh, the fiddle necks and the popcorn flowers in the borage family. So all that is, uh, borage family is increased in size, whereas some of the other families, like uh, the traditional lily family, have been split up into lots of groups. Also, the, the Scrofulariaceae family has been split up, but this one's been lumped. And this is a very, another one kind of like uh, the uh, shooting star, and it's a, it's a good shade plant in, under oaks in, in oak woodland. It uh, can be, be quite abundant. Uh, it tends to last a little longer than the uh, shooting stars. So you can see this uh, further into April, whereas the uh, uh, shooting stars tend to wither pretty early, they're very early, but it looks like you were uh, fortunate enough to get them on Silver Spur uh, late enough to take these pictures. Yes, uh, and Steve Rodriguez asked uh, hydrophilic, and I don't know if he's referring to this nemophilia or the other one previous. So maybe Steve, if you could clarify, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, a nemophila is a genus in this former hydrophilaceae family. There's also another one that is in the Sierra Nevada, another genus called hydrophilum that uh, is more a, a montane plant. But both of those have been moved into the borage family now. Yeah, he was uh, asking about the monkey flower. Monkey, oh yeah, monkey flower is another one that has been, good question. This is another one that has been split out of the, the old Scrofulariaceae family. And it's now in a family called Frymaceae uh, that was named for a little aquatic plant. Uh, but if you uh, uh, look closely at the morphology and the genetics, it's uh, much more closely related to this little aquatic a frymum plant than it is to things in the Scrofulariaceae. So, so now it's the, because it's a, another one that's really diversified, especially in California, it has a few very widespread uh, plants that are uh, associated with wetlands, but the ones that are associated with dry habitats have uh, really exploded uh, evolutionarily in California and have added an awful lot to our uh, biodiversity here and there's uh, something like 70 or 80 species and they take up most most of the Frymaceae family in uh, in North America and, and California. And here we have a, uh, a more delicate slender relative of uh, the uh, Chinese houses. This is uh, in uh, the same genus as Kalinzia as the Chinese houses but you notice the uh, Flowers aren't nearly as clustered. Uh, the uh, leaves tend to be smaller and more delicate, and uh, the whole plant is it's just like a, a smaller, delicate, more delicate version of Chinese houses. And the habitat tends to be similar. This is another one that's associated with uh, partial shade in oak woodlands. And sometimes it could be white. This is a, just a white uh, form of uh, um, Blue eyed Mary. Blue eyed Mary without blue eyes. Mm -hmm. And we have a number of uh, look alike buttercups in California. Uh, the most abundant one uh, in the Silver Spur Ranch area and uh, the Bear Valley area is Sacramento Valley buttercup, Ranunculus canis, but there's some real look alikes. So this is one that if you find it in different parts of California, uh, they can look very similar. So you want to take a very close look at, uh, at the details uh, to be sure that you have the right species. It'll take more than just a picture to, to be sure. This is a, a, a interesting plant because it's uh, more common uh, in the intercoast range, uh, much further south in California. It tends to be uh, very abundant in the hills around Carriza Plains and extends right down to the uh, hills bordering the Mojave Desert. But from there it extends north uh, in the rain shadow of the coast range along the inner edge of the coast range. And it gets up into uh, even the north coast range as far north as Tehama County. 
but always on the very much the east side of the uh, coast range, not on the uh, wetter west outer side of the coast range. Interior golden bush, uh, and you can see it's another member of that composite family. You can see the little uh, fertile flowers in the center, and then what we call the ray flowers, the ones that attract the pollinators on the outside. That's a very, very common pattern in, uh, in that, uh, what used to be called the composite family, still sometimes referred to as a composite family, but the name of the family now is Asteraceae, named after the asters, which are also in that family. And this is a uh, woolly lomatium, uh, another one of those uh, members of the carrot family. Lomatium of all the members of the carrot family has the most species uh, native to California. And it's another one that is, has really exploded evolutionarily in California, up and down California, in lots of habitats. You have many, many different lomatium species and including right here in the North Coast Range. We have, uh, we have a couple of uh, uh, native species there. And I can't be sure that we have the right, the, just from this, you really need a hand lens and, and uh, close detail to be sure, but one of the lomations up there is Willie Lomation, and this looks like it might be that, but I'm not positive with just the flower here without being able to examine it more closely. What would be another Lomation that would be up there? It might be, another, it might be one of the Sanicles too, you know, because that's also in the same group, and uh, without more information to compare, it looks. Like, in fact, it looks like you might have a, a purple sanicle uh, there on the left, and uh, so that sometimes the purple sanicle will have both purple and yellow flowers. So I'm not sure this isn't a purple sanicle. Okay. Yeah, it was uh, in amongst uh, like the picture, like you pointed out, there was purple sanicle right there, but there's a lot more that looked like this. So. Yeah. Yeah. So it's if probably it's probably Willie Lomation growing in with the purple sanicle, but that's one we want to get a little more information on to be sure. Okay. And this is a uh, yellow tidy tips. Now most of the tidy tips are uh, characterized by having uh, white tips on the flower, including this particular species, uh, Lea platyglosa. And uh, but the ones in in our area up here in uh, Silver Spur Ranch in Bear Valley are all yellow, and it's kind of a kind of a different variety, uh, but uh, a good member of that uh, species, Lea platyglosa. But we also have uh, uh, another tidy tips that's more typical uh, in the same area called uh, Lea chrysanthemoides, which does have the more typical pattern of yellow at the base of the ray flowers and white at the tips. And you can see this is another uh, member of that uh, Asteraceae family with the fertile flowers in the middle and then the uh, ring of ray flowers to attract the pollinators along the outside. And this particular one is another one like low wives that is in the part of the Asteraceae that's related to those Hawaiian silver swords. But this particular group is especially associated with valley floors in California. So it's in Bear Valley, it's uh, in the small valley at, uh, at uh, Silver Spur Ranch and it uh, was one of the uh, groups that uh, covered the Central Valley when John Muir first saw it. Of course, that's mostly farmland now, uh, but you can see it in Carissa Plains, and you can even see it in certain really rainy years. Uh, it was one year, uh, oh, about uh, 10 years ago, where it covered uh, all the fields around I-5 not this species, but a close relative that was had all white ray flowers. And uh, that really was a kind of remembrance of uh, that there are still, uh, there's still a seed bank there in a lot of these uh, uh, farm fields where the wildflowers can come back if they're given, given a chance. So there's even, even plant diversity in, in the uh, San Joaquin Valley. And here's one of several, uh, we call it short pod lotus, short potted lotus, because uh, the old genus was lotus, but now it's been uh, split off into uh, a native genus, acme spawn, and the lotus species that we have are old world relatives that have been introduced to California, and some of those are quite quite common weeds. But we have a number of uh, native species 
often they're small, but there's a few that are pretty showy as well. This is one of the smaller, but still very abundant uh, plants, usually in kind of rocky hillsides, oftentimes in road cuts, places like that, rocky well-drained areas. Uh, and I will say that the, the flowers that you see uh, are much smaller than your fingernail, much, much smaller. Very, very small, very tiny. The whole plant's very tiny, actually. Yeah. And there's uh, several other close relatives. This is another one that you want to really get down close. And oftentimes uh, it's good to have the mature legume or pod because some of the most striking differences are in the kinds of uh, pods that they produce. This one is called short potted. Uh, lotus because its pods tend to, to be kind of stubby, whereas there's some that are very long and thin and, and even uh, curl into a, uh, a crescent shape. Uh, and Arlene, I do see your question about whether uh, Silver Spur is open to the public. I'm just, I'm holding off until the end. I'm going to touch on that. Uh, so I'm, I'm not ignoring you and I, I, I have seen it. Well, I, uh, not everything in the Asteraceae or the composite family is, has a showy uh, head with fertile flowers in the middle and ray flowers that attract insects on the outside. There's some like this one and uh, called slender cottonweed. It's also in that family. Very, very abundant uh, native plant found in uh, usually in prairie under, under oak trees in uh, not necessarily full sun, but not very shady either. It's very, very widespread in these kind of transitional habitats between oak woodland and uh, California prairie. Usually not in big masses, but still quite common. One of the common names I've heard, uh, heard it referred to as are Q-tips. And you can kind of see from the, the way the plant looks uh, why that why it might get that name of Q-tips. But uh, Micropus californicus. Abundant, native. Uh, this is one that you have to it's, uh, it's, uh, have to be kind of a connoisseur to appreciate because uh, it's not one of our, our showy native wildflowers, but it's it's definitely part of our uh, biodiversity here in California. So those are the flowers. It's not like the the seed, like a dandelion goes to to seed. Those are no. Those are the actual. Not even the flowers. They're actually the heads, which have several flowers buried under that wool. And so uh, it doesn't open up uh, with a kind of a parachute head like the dandelion or the blow wipes. It, uh, it tends to not have, uh, uh, probably actually just kind of dies in place and doesn't have any particular method for dispersing its seeds. And here's the most common of all the lomations. This is definitely a, uh, a lomation. You can see all the, the good characteristics there. Uh, this one is not woolly. It has bright green fern-like foliage, bright yellow flowers, uh, quite, quite widespread and common, uh, usually in prairie openings in, in woodland, rather than, uh, it's usually not on the flora valley so much as in small prairie openings, uh, but also in full sun though, not so much in the shade of oak trees. Easy one to find uh, throughout the North Coast Range. You can find it on the road to Bear Valley. You can find it in Silver Spur Ranch. And um, this lomatium is the largest genus in the carrot family of a native species here in California. There's probably about 50 species uh, in a wide range of habitats from Southern California to Northern California, but more diverse here than uh, uh, pretty much anywhere else in the world. Uh, okay, uh, Steve is asking specifically for the slideshow available on the website. Yes, Steve, we will, uh, as I said, we'll, we were recording this, uh, but we are uh, looking into putting the slideshow, uh, making the slideshow available uh, as well. Well, here's uh, our little golden violet. And uh, this is a kind of unusual in that, of course, violets are, are named for the fact that most of them are blue. This one's not, it's yellow, uh, kind of a golden yellow. Most of them tend to be uh, in the shade of forests, uh, kind of very moist areas, either uh, forest wetlands or, or sometimes just forest understory. This was out in the prairie, and, uh, but not, not terribly widespread. It's usually in 
just a few spots here and there in the prairie, so it's not always easy to find. And it's a very important plant the, uh, for butterflies because uh, the fritillary group of butterflies, including some very rare species, uh, uh, uses violets. And so some of the rare fritillaries uh, depend on uh, these patches of uh, this golden violet or Douglas's violet, sometimes it's referred to, uh, that are just scattered here and there, usually on ridge tops in, uh, in the coast range. So very, very good that you could find some of this at uh, Silver Spur Ranch. It adds to the uh, ecological importance of the ranch to be able to protect this population of, of golden violets. Uh, this was just thrown in, uh, just as an ending. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, how uh, a lot of silver spur looks, all the flowers mixed in uh, together. Yeah. We do have one that we didn't cover with a, a specific picture, though, that uh, composite or Asteraceae member there in the middle, that kind of sunflower-like is a woolly sunflower. Uh, and that's... Uh, one that is actually the most uh, abundant of all the fire flowers, uh, fire followers after burns. So we'll probably see a lot more of this. Back when the Walker Ridge burned, uh, there were whole hillsides that were bright yellow as uh, a result of uh, just masses of this. Now it's always there, but when there's a fire, it just becomes incredibly more abundant. And uh, the name of this one is. Uh, Arisum uh, linatum, woolly sunflower. We didn't have a, one of the particular slides showing this one. Looks a little bit like the uh, golden bush. Flower is very similar to the golden bush, but this one has much hairier uh, foliage, so it's gonna look a little bit more gray green, whereas the uh, golden bush is, interior golden bush is gonna look very bright green, but the flower is very similar. And that's the yellow loop in there. And it looks like a lot of the rest is bitch. I would agree with that. But yes, so this is uh, just a typical, typical day at Silver Spur Ranch in the spring. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, of course, thank you, Glenn. Uh, thank you for your knowledge and telling us all about it. There's uh, lots of scientific names that um, I have already forgotten but I have them on the slideshow so I can go back in and uh, review. Uh, also, I can, um, I understand now how things are more related uh, seeing the scientific name. So I hope that was helpful to other people as well. And that's also, a great prairie picture, uh, great uh, prairie picture that uh, kind of captures the way, uh, unbelievably, the flora of the Central Valley was described by John Muir when he walked across in 1868. But we're preserving it in these little uh, little valleys like the one at Silver Spur Ranch. And I will say, you know, everybody yeah. thinks that taking pretty pictures of pretty flowers is easy and a wonderful thing. But I mean, it's difficult squatting down to take that picture. Uh, but no, it's it's a, a wonderful thing. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Bill Grabert, also one of the another Tuliomi staff member. Uh, he shared uh, a lot of his pictures. We used a lot of his pictures in this, um, and. Uh, if you want to go out to uh, the property, we right now we are going out about once every month, once every two months uh, to service our game cameras. That's a good way to experience um, uh, the property. But after shelter in place is done, yes, we definitely want to get uh, people out there. Um, we don't have any specific plans because we don't know when this is going to end, but we want to get people out there, whether it's for the day. Uh, the weekend or just an overnight. Uh, if you want to be part of a cleanup crew or a habitat restoration crew, uh, definitely uh, get in touch with me and you can see my uh, email.